Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of chapter 30. And for this video, we're going to look at two of the three methods that can be used to induce current within a coil. And we're going to use um, an, a solenoid for this example. Um, for this particular example, we're going to start with method one, which is to change the magnitude of the magnetic field that is passing through the coil. And then we'll look at a change in surface area. And then I'm actually going to save the change in angle for the next video because that's going to lead us into another topic. And so it's going to be better suited for a, a separate video. Um, so just to to uh, review from the last video of all of these methods that are used to induce current. They all have one thing in common, which is that we're changing the magnetic flux of the system. Magnetic flux is defined as the magnetic field that passes through a defined surface area, and we use our dot product to evaluate that. As such, there are three different ways that magnetic flux can change. We can change the magnetic field, we can change the cross-sectional area, or we can change the angle between those two vectors. And then we're going to apply Lenz's law, which tells us what induced amount of EMF is going to be produced by that change in magnetic flux. And then if we apply Ohm's law, so Ohm's law is V equals IR, except we're now going to write it in terms of the induced values. We're going to induce an EMF in this coil, and that will in turn induce current through that coil. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we as we step through this first example problem, and we'll, um, we'll actually draw the symbol of an EMF to represent what is happening with that uh, induced EMF value. And that'll, that'll help us to better understand what's happening in this system. So for our first example, we'll go ahead and take our, whoops, I don't know what happened there try that again. We will draw ourselves a coil and we'll say that this coil has n turns to it and there is a magnetic field, an external magnetic field that passes through this coil. The coil itself will have a cross-sectional area associated with it and that cross-sectional area points up, try that again, points up, there we go. And so now, Lenz's law says that there will be an electromagnetic, or, um, excuse me, an electromotive force, an EMF, that will be induced in this coil, and the value of that induced EMF will equal negative N times the time dependent change of the magnetic flux that is passing through that coil. So back up to the definition of the magnetic flux. There are three different ways that the flux can change, either magnetic field, area, or angle. As we said, we're going to uh, start with the first example, which will be a change in the magnetic field itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide an expression that describes how the magnetic field in this particular system is going to change with respect to time. And I'm just going to throw out a random function. And so as the, as the clock ticks along, the magnetic field for the system will change according to that equation. And so as time goes by, 
the magnetic field itself changes, which will result in an induced EMF for the circuit. And when that happens, Ohm's law takes over, and based on whatever resistance this wire has, we will see an induced current start to pass through that coil. Well, let's take this function and apply it to Lenz's law. And Lenz's law says we have to take a derivative with respect to time. Okay. Um, take a step back here. The derivative is for the magnetic flux. So we'll take a moment and look at the expression for magnetic flux. We need to know the magnitude, the area, and the angle relationship for the system. Well, the first thing to note is that the only thing that's going to change in this system is the magnetic field. We're going to keep the cross-sectional area constant, and we're going to keep the angle relationship between these two vectors constant as well. In fact, the, the angle between those is zero. Cosine of zero is one. So the only thing left that we have to worry about is um, the product of B and A. As far as the cross-sectional area of this loop goes, um, it, I mean, it looks like a circular coil, so we could, we could say that A is equal to pi r squared, whatever the radius of that coil happens to be. But I'm just going to continue calling that A for right now. So the only thing that's actually going to change with respect to the magnetic flux is the magnetic field. Everything else stays as it is. So we need to take the derivative of our magnetic field function. That's fairly straightforward. We're going to get 12t squared minus 8. And so that's the function that describes the changing magnetic field in the system. Twelve t squared minus eight times the area times cosine theta, which we said cosine theta was just going to go to one. So that's our that's our function that's describing how the magnetic flux in the system is changing. We can now plug that in to Lenz's law. And so Lenz's law says the induced EMF will be the change in the flux times negative n. So I'll just bring a negative n through that expression. And now all that's left for us to do is if we wanted to uh, define how many turns are in this coil, maybe there's 20 turns in the coil, and maybe our coil has a radius of 2 centimeters. In that case, we have pi 0 0.02 squared. We'll get my calculator app running on my phone. Point zero two squared times pi makes for zero point zero zero one two six. And this would be square meters. But now those values can go in as 20.00126. And then uh, we'll actually have to insert a time value to get the rest of the numerical entries. But the 0.00125 and the 20 that's going to make for a negative 0 
And so there's our induced EMF function. Now, what do we do with that? Well, at any given time, we can plug in a value for time, and we can solve for the value of the induced EMF at that particular time. So if we were to say uh, after 10 seconds have gone by, what is the value of the induced EMF? So we would plug in 10 for T. 10 squared is going to make for 100 times the 12 minus the 8 and then times the 0 0.0. 251 out front makes for something just shy of 30 volts. Now, why is it volts? Well, because this is an EMF. And if you remember from our discussions in chapter 26, the electromotive force is the source of electric potential that is used for the circuit. That source could be a battery, it could be a generator, it could be a, a solar panel. But now, the source of this um, electric potential is actually coming from the changes in the magnetic flux of the system. So what does this mean for us? Well, we have a potential difference of Roughly, I'm just going to round this up to 30. We'll just call that good for right now. So we have a potential difference of roughly 30 volts across this coil. And the coil itself is made of some kind of material. Maybe it's copper. And so there will be a certain resistivity value associated with that coil. The length of the wire that is used to make the coil and the cross-sectional area of the wire itself, not the cross-section of the coil, but the cross-sectional area of the wire. So we want to be specific about this. The length of the coil is not, I repeat, not the length of the wire. The wire is what you're using to make up all of those coils, and so the length of the wire is going to be much larger than the length of the coil. Um, the cross-sectional area of the wire should be very, very small compared to the cross-section of the coil. But these values are what get together, and they tell us what the resistance of that coil is going to be. And from there, that tells us how much current we can expect to be traveling through that coil at any given time. And that's because if we take our induced EMF expression and we set it equal to what we had from Ohm's law, the resistance of the coil, as long as it's not changing its temperature, will remain constant, and that means that the induced current inside of that coil is also going to be time dependent because our function for the induced EMF is time dependent. So we would get, what, a negative 0 0.0251 divided by whatever the resistance of that coil is, and we have the 12t squared over 8. And so that would be an equation that tells us what the induced current is at any given time. Now, does this mean that our EMF always has to be time dependent? Not necessarily. Uh, likewise, the induced current does not necessarily have to be time dependent. What determines that is how your magnetic field function is changing. Remember that we had to take the derivative of that magnetic field function 
and after one derivative, the function was still time dependent. Well, what if my magnetic field was this, as opposed to what the previous field was? In this case, the change in the magnetic field would just be a constant value, and then that would carry through the math, and it would give us a constant EMF, which would result in a constant induced current. So both, both are possibilities for a given system, but that's why I wanted to show you the more uh, complex of the two cases. So, okay, we can solve for the induced EMF for this coil. I'm going to go back to the original function that we were using for the magnetic field because um, that's where we got our, our um, instantaneous 30 volt potential difference. And let's say that the, the overall resistance of this particular coil is 10 ohms. So if that's the case, the induced current at time 10 seconds would be equal to the induced EMF at 10 seconds divided by the resistance. We already know what the induced EMF is at 10 seconds. That was 30. And if we're working with a resistance of 10 ohms, then we have an induced current equal to negative 3 amps at that 10 second mark. But as time goes by, obviously that um, number is going to change. Okay, so we know how much of an EMF is going to be present in this coil. We know how much current is going to be present in this coil. So are we ever going to learn about uh, why we have that minus sign in Lentz's law? because the, the N should make perfect sense. N is measuring the number of loops that are in the coil, and every loop is going to have a certain amount of cross-sectional area that the magnetic field has to pass through, and so every loop is going to contribute to the overall EMF. But why the negative sign? Well, let's talk about that. If we look back at the expression that we had for the change in the magnetic field, and this is before we plug it into the EMF expression, um, you'll notice that as time goes by, the magnetic field gets larger and larger and larger. Um, we, can, we can start at zero and we have a negative, but then as we start putting in more time values, the change in the magnetic field starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes by. So this means that the magnitude of the external magnetic field is increasing with respect to time. Okay, it's getting bigger. Uh, let's try this. Um, We'll say it's, it's greater than zero, so it's getting bigger. Well, if the magnetic field is getting bigger, then that means that the magnetic flux for this system is also getting bigger. Now, let's take what we know about the right-hand rule, and let's just look at one one coil of this, or um, I should say one turn of this particular coil. And if I pass a magnetic field through that coil, well, 
the straight line portion of our diagram. The straight line portion of our diagram is supposed to be our thumb. Again, using the right hand rule. And the curved portion of the diagram is going to be the curvature of our fingers. Well, if I, if I point my thumb in the direction of the magnetic field, then my fingers curve in such a way that they go into the page and around. And so this gives me sort of a road map as to the direction that the current would be associated with. And this is, this is what we would expect using the right hand rule. Well, in the previous video, you'll remember we, we wrote out two different laws. We had Faraday's law, which said that the induced EMF was proportional to the change in the magnetic flux for the system. But then it was Lenz's law that said, well, there's only, uh, there's only one extra thing that you have to include here to turn this into an equality, and that's a negative N. Well, the, the N makes sense. N is measuring the number of turns in our coil. But why the negative sign? Well, that's because the induced current flows opposite of the expected direction. So when we look at this, this diagram here, we have our magnetic field oriented up, and the right hand rule tells us that we would expect the current to follow that particular path. But in reality, when we go to measure that induced current, we find that the induced current is actually flowing in the opposite direction. And that is the reason for the minus sign in Lenz's law. Well, so what does that, what does that mean for us? We, we have a, a coil up here with a magnetic field that is passing through it. And so am I, am I expecting the induced current to flow up? Or down through that coil. And in this case it might be best if we could maybe zoom in on the coil itself. So I'm going to say that the, the coil, I'm just going to put some little arrows here to indicate that the coil first goes into the board and then out of the board. I'm not really sure of, of how else we can uh, indicate the direction of those coils, but um, now we see that we have this external magnetic field that is passing through that coil. Well, are we going to expect to see the current traveling up or down through that coil. Looking at the example that we just saw here, well, it would kind of imply that the, the induced current should be flowing in a direction that would carry it ultimately the coil. But 
uh, we, we still have a little bit left to discuss on this matter. The induced EMF. Instead of, instead of looking at the, uh, the induced current for right now, let's focus on the induced EMF because that is ultimately what is going to create the induced current. And to help us out with this, I'm going to um, take the coil that we've been using and let's just um, take ourselves back to a single loop. So we're going to look at an overhead view of a loop of wire. And I want the magnetic field to come out of the page. So there's our magnetic field. And then just to, just to help us, uh, we'll do a side view. Side view, there we go, with the same magnetic field coming up. Now, the, re the reason I want the two different views is so that I can see the direction of the induced current and have it make a bit more sense than trying to, to figure out the, the three-dimensional drawing on this 2D surface, which is not always easy to pull off. All right. So let's say that the magnetic field, this external magnetic field, is changing and it's getting bigger with respect to time. Well, we would expect to see current traveling in a counterclockwise direction associated with this magnetic field except that electromagnetic induction says that the induced current is actually going to do the opposite of what you think. That minus sign means that we have to flip around the induced EMF that we see. So all of these little arrows here that we drew that implied the direction that we were expecting to happen, they're all wrong. We need an induced EMF that is going to go opposite of what we were expecting. I need the induced current to travel this way. So what does that mean for the induced EMF? Is there some way that I can draw on this coil of wire the symbol for an EMF that would agree with the direction of the induced current that we're seeing? And the answer is, sure, we can do that. The symbol for an EMF in a circuit was just the symbol for a battery. All I need to do is place the symbol of a battery somewhere on this circular loop such that it agrees with the direction that the current is flowing. And so I can do that just like this. Remember that the large side of the EMF symbol indicates the direction of positive charge flow, and that's the direction that the current needs to be traveling. So there's my induced EMF symbol. And this, this induced EMF is occurring because we have an external magnetic field that is changing, and it's becoming stronger. So why do I have to have the current flowing in the opposite direction? Okay, here's where everything is going to come together for us. Using the right hand rule with the induced current. The induced current is traveling in a clockwise direction around that coil. As such, the induced current is going to create an induced magnetic field. What direction will that induced magnetic field point? 
and so we're going to uh, we're going to ignore the external magnetic field and we're just going to focus on the induced current as that induced current travels around the circle let your let your fingers curve in the direction of the induced current and as you do that your thumb should be pointing into the page well why is this happening and this is because induction counters what is happening in the system. We can almost think of this kind of like Newton's third law. For every force, there is an equal and opposite counterforce. Well, in this case, we don't have forces. But we do have one phenomenon creating another. We have an external magnetic field that is inducing a current. But then in turn, that current induces another magnetic field. So why do we have to have the countering effect? Well, think of, think of the alternative. If we had the opposite happen, and we'll draw a picture here to show what that uh, opposite scenario would be. So imagine you had your external magnetic field passing through this um, coil. And let's just say that the induced current traveled in the counterclockwise direction. So now we would have a, an EMF that looked like this. Well, what is that induced current going to do? What kind of magnetic field will that induced current produce? Well, that current is the curve. So curve your fingers around the direction of the coil following the current. And in that case, your thumb pops up out of the page. And so you've now increased the amount of magnetic field that is passing through the coil. Well, what happens when you increase magnetic field? Well, you induce more current. And so now your induced current gets stronger. What happens as your induced current gets stronger? Well, you induce more magnetic field. What happens when you induce more field? Your current gets stronger. As your current gets stronger, you induce more field. And, well, can this really happen? Effectively, you've just found a way to produce unlimited current and energy. And basically, this is, um, you know, one, one step above what a perpetual motion machine would be. This is not something that is going to happen. The, the universe is not going to allow something to just spontaneously build upon itself and get bigger and bigger and stronger and more powerful. If anything, the universe is going to try and disperse or reduce whatever is happening in your system. Hence, the countering effect. When we change the magnetic field that passes through the coil, the coil responds by inducing a current, which will in turn induce a magnetic field to counteract what is happening in the system. So let's see what just happened here. Um, we had a magnetic field that was getting stronger so what did the system do in response? Well, the system generated an induced magnetic field that pointed in the direction opposite of what our external magnetic field was pointing. In other words, the, the system is literally trying to prevent what is happening over here. 
And that is what the minus sign on Lenz's law tells us. Let's try another discussion uh, similar to the first one. Let's say our external magnetic field is still traveling upward, but this time that external magnetic field is getting weaker. So as this field gets weaker, what happens? Well, in the, in the sense of getting weaker, it's, it's becoming smaller, or we could say it's becoming more negative. So what does the system have to do to counteract that? Another way of thinking about it is that the system wants to maintain a balance. With the first example, the magnetic field that we were putting through the coil was getting stronger. So what did the system do in response? It produced a magnetic field to weaken the effect of the external field becoming stronger. Well, now we have the opposite occurring. The external magnetic field is getting weaker. What does the system have to do to balance that out? Well, the system is going to have to introduce a magnetic field to try and maintain the balance. And so we would actually see an induced magnetic field traveling in the same direction as the external magnetic field. If that doesn't quite make sense, uh, think of it from the perspective of Lenz's law. That minus sign says that Lenz's law is going to counteract what's happening in the system. Okay, well, what's happening in the system? What's happening to the magnetic flux in this particular system? If the magnetic field is becoming weaker, then the magnetic flux itself is what is becoming more negative. What do you get when you have two negatives? You get a positive. Hence the addition of the induced magnetic field to attempt to counter what is happening and maintain balance in the system. So this, this idea of countering whatever is happening in the system is going to be a consistent theme throughout the rest of this chapter. No matter what we do to the system, the system is always going to counter or at least attempt to counter what we are doing. Now that is the example that we have for the change in the magnetic field. Now we're going to switch over to a change in the cross-sectional area. And to try and change the cross-sectional area for a coil like this is not really that easy. Because, um, you know, we'd have to grab hold of that coil and either uh, stretch it or compress it. And that would mean changing the number of loops, um, changing the obvious dimensions of the coil. So we're not, we're not going to try that approach. I don't want a coil that has multiple loops in it. But that's okay because we can get away with having um, a single coil and still have it act as a loop. So the coil that I have in mind is not going to be a circular coil, but a rectangular coil. So what we have here is um, sort of a, a U-shaped rod 
of conducting material. And this rod has a length of L on one side. And then these legs extend for a very, very, very long distance towards the right. Now this does not constitute a loop. I have to have a closed path, or I at least have to have um, a starting point and an ending point that overlap. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a rod. Actually, we'll make that a little bit longer. I am going to take a rod made of a conducting material and I'll lay that right over the top of those two very long legs and the rod itself will be able to slide back and forth over the two kind of like a track and as I do that as I slide this rod back and forth along the track, I end up changing the cross-sectional area of this closed loop that I've just made. We will have some magnetic field lines passing through the page. Uh, we can either have them uh, coming out of the page or going into the page, but I'm going to choose into the page just because the last example had magnetic field coming out of the page. And these magnetic field lines are all throughout the system and they are constant. So magnetic field lines, they're everywhere inside and out and they're constant so the magnitude of our field is constant but as we slide the rod as we slide this rod the cross-sectional area of our loop is going to change if I slide the rod to the right, the cross-sectional area gets larger. If I slide the rod to the left, the cross-sectional area gets smaller. I need to know, with respect to the magnetic flux, how is that cross-sectional area going to change? Because the next step is to take the derivative of our flux, so that we can relate it to the amount of induced EMF that is going to occur. And once we know that, then we can start talking about uh, induced current. Oops, I had the wrong subscript there. There we go. All right, so the magnetic field is going to remain constant. We'll have a constant value of B. The cross-sectional area is going to change with respect to time, and we will keep the angle relationship between our cross-sectional area and our magnetic field vector constant. Well, so what's the, what's the angle relationship between the cross-sectional area and the magnetic field? The magnetic field is currently pointing into the page. When it comes to the cross-sectional area, remember that our cross-sectional area vector has to point perpendicular to the surface area itself. Now, our surface area is on the surface of the screen. And there's only two ways that I can draw a vector perpendicular to the screen. It either has to point into the screen or out of the screen. Those are the choices. I am going to choose into the screen just because 
the magnetic field itself is already pointing into the screen. And that will result in a dot product that evaluates to uh, cosine 0 or 1. So that's going to be my designation for that. Since cosine theta just goes to 1, we are left with the change in magnetic flux equals B dA dt. Well, I need to know how is that area changing? Well, what's the definition of area? In this case, we have a rectangle, so what's the definition of area? Well, it's length times width. We know the length of the rectangle, it's L. So let's put in a value that we can use to measure the changing width. And I'm just going to use X. So right now the width of this loop is X, but it's going to change with respect to time as we move that rod. Okay, if area equals length times width, what happens when we take the derivative of that? The length of the coil is constant. It's only the width that is changing. And so L is a constant. And now we have dx dt. Well, dx dt can be substituted for v, where v is the velocity with which the rod is sliding. So we'll go ahead and use that. We'll say that the change in the area for this coil is B L V, where V is the velocity of the rod. Okay, so that's the change in the magnetic flux for the system, which means that we have an induced EMF of negative N B L V. All right, well, what's the negative sign mean? Well, negative sign means that whatever induced EMF we get, whatever induced current we get, it has to oppose what is happening in the system. Well, what's happening in the system? For starters, that rod is not going to move all by itself. There has to have been some kind of applied force that we presented to get that rod moving. All right, well, um, equal and opposite forces, Newton's third law, says that if we're going to apply a force and if electromagnetic induction says that induction has to counter what is happening in the system, whatever induced current that we get traveling around this loop, keep in mind that that induced current will have to start traveling through the external magnetic field that is present. And what happens when a current passes through a magnetic field? Well, there's a magnetic force that acts on it. Now, specifically, we are talking about an induced current, but the math doesn't care. We still have a current that current is going to travel through a length of L under the influence of the external magnetic field, and it's going to generate a force. Well, where is that force going to be generated? We, we could um, theoretically have forces acting on all sides of this loop. But in particular, I'm interested in knowing what kind of 
counter force we're going to get acting on that rod. And we already know what the length of the rod is. It's L. So here's what has to happen. This has to happen. We have to have a counter force generated on that rod to counteract the applied force. Well, the only way that we can counter that, if we're going to have equal and opposite directions, I have to have a magnetic force that points in the direction that is opposite of the applied force. And this is the key to telling us what is going to happen in this system. Because right now, um, if I if I try to find the direction of the induced current in this circuit, I may as well just flip a coin because I really don't know at this point. I know that the current is either going to have to run up or down through that rod. But our equation for magnetic force will tell us exactly what direction that induced current must flow if we're going to produce this necessary counterforce. So here we go. The direction of the magnetic force is known. It has to point to the left. The direction of the external magnetic field is known. It has to point into the screen. The only thing that's left is to find out what direction through the rod that induced current has to travel, up or down. And we could find this by using, yet again, the right hand rule. The right hand rule says that the first vector in your cross product is your index finger. Well, we don't know what direction our index finger is supposed to be pointing in just yet, so we'll, we'll skip that part. The second vector in your cross product is your middle finger. We know the direction that the magnetic field needs to point. It's into the page. So point your middle finger into the page. The resulting vector of the cross product is the direction that your thumb points. And so keeping our middle finger pointing into the page, pointing our thumb to the left, our index finger can only point up without uh, breaking it. And that right there tells me the direction that the induced current is going to flow for this particular problem. How does that help me? Well, it also tells me the direction that the induced EMF is going to have to point. You can draw the symbol for a battery anywhere along the perimeter of this coil as long as it agrees with the direction of induced current that has to happen. So I've, I've chosen to draw my EMF symbol down on the bottom leg, but the big plate on the battery indicates the source of positive charge. Now, once again, the induced EMF, it's not a real physical object, but we put the symbol there just to remind us of what is happening as a result of changing the magnetic flux in the system. And we've, we've already taken care of the minus sign here. That minus sign, we used that right here in arguing the fact that the system has to counter what is happening. Electromagnetic induction has to counter what is happening in the system. If we're going to pull that rod to the right, induction is going to have to produce a counter force that pulls to the left. So what would happen if 
we decided to push the rod to the left instead. In that case, electromagnetic induction would have to provide a counterforce that points to the right. And if that happened, then that would mean that the induced current would have to flip over and the induced EMF would have to flip over. But that's exactly what we should expect at this point for the system to counter what we are doing. So now we can say that the induced EMF, which has, uh, in this case, if we wanted to just use the magnitude, we could do that. But we can set that EMF value equal to the induced current times the resistance of that coil. Now, this is an interesting uh, discussion because as we as we slide that rod back and forth, what happens to the length of the path that those charges have to follow? If I slide the rod to the right, the overall length of the closed path becomes larger. And as the path of charge becomes larger, the resistance becomes larger. If we slide the rod to the left, the path that the charge has to follow becomes shorter and the resistance becomes smaller. And so by, by uh, changing the dimension of the loop itself, we also end up changing the resistance. And in turn, that can have an effect on the amount of induced current that can flow through that system. All right, one last bit for this particular um, example problem. Since we have an induced EMF with a value of magnitude NBLV, so this is the magnitude of our induced EMF, Back in chapter, let's see, what was it, 26, we learned, or maybe it was 27. In any case, we learned that um, the rate at which power is dissipated within a circuit can be written a couple of different ways. Uh, we can use the current times the potential difference. We can use the current times the resistance or equivalent resistance of the circuit. Or we can use the potential with respect to the equivalent resistance of the circuit. These equations all came from our discussions of current potential resistance in the previous chapters. And as far as the math is concerned, the math doesn't care if you're using uh, regular current or induced current. As far as the math is concerned, current is current. And so that means that we can rewrite these equations with respect to the induced values that we are seeing. Instead of regular current, we have induced current flowing through our circuit. And the potential associated with that circuit is now coming from the induced EMF. Or we could write this as induced current times resistance of the circuit squared. Or we could write it as induced EMF squared over resistance of current. But this means that at any given time, there is a certain amount of energy that is being dissipated by this circuit as the rod slides back and forth. And I want to know how much, how much energy that is. Well, these three equations will tell us that if, if we can get 
uh, numerical values for the induced current, the induced EMF, or the resistance of the circuit. Now, I don't know exactly what the resistance of this particular circuit is, and given the fact that the resistance is technically changing as we slide back and forth, because the the distance that charge has to travel through that loop changes as we slide the rod back and forth. Um, I, I can try putting together some expressions. We have the magnitude of the EMF right there. The current would just be the EMF divided by the resistance. And so if we multiplied those two together, um, well, I would still need to know something about the resistance of the circuit. Uh, NBLV quantity squared over R. That's what I would end up getting for the, the power associated with this loop. But... Uh, there's actually an easier way to figure out the rate at which energy is going to be dissipated by this circuit. And I don't even have to know anything about the circuit other than the fact that I am applying a certain amount of force to this rod, which is going to travel at a speed of V. And so there's actually a fourth equation that we can use to represent the rate at which energy is being dissipated by this circuit. And that is a physics 1 expression. And if you remember from physics 1, power is the rate at which work is done. And work can be found as the dot product of force with respect to displacement. But the moment we divide this by time, that displacement turns into velocity. And we have all of that stuff right there in front of us. We can measure that applied force. We can measure that velocity. And that applied force that applied force is what is going to provide energy so that the rod can move. But then that energy has to go into producing the counter force to counteract what we're doing. I know it, it sounds like a almost like a revolving door here with these statements, one thing counters another and vice versa. But the rate at which we provide work to the system is going to have to equal the rate at which the system dissipates that energy. Because this, this, uh, this loop here, this circuit, it doesn't have any means of storing that energy. We can't just put energy into that rod and expect it to stay there. That energy is in turn going to be dissipated in the form of heat. And that is accomplished by the resistance of the circuit. We, we put an induced current through that rod. That rod has a certain amount of resistance associated with it, and that's going to generate heat, which will dissipate. But conservation of energy says we can only dissipate the energy as fast as we receive it, and vice versa. All right, well, that's uh, more than enough information for one video. When we get back, we'll look at the third case scenario of changing the angle relationship with respect to the magnetic field and the area vector.
And then after we get done with that example, we'll start talking about the concept of alternating current. Because everything so far in this semester has been with respect to direct current or DC. And this implies that the current within the circuit has only been flowing in one direction. Now we need to see what happens when our current uh, changes direction and how that's going to affect things with all of our electric and magnetic expressions. So see you back for the next video.